just filming a skit for the Japanathon video. The what? The Japan uh, Japanese movie marathon video I'm doing. Just filming a skit for it. Shouldn't you be editing the 24 hour movie marathon? Probably. Yeah. Good point. Okay, never mind. Hello and welcome to Japanathon, the goofy named, the well-intentioned marathon of Japanese films, which I'll be doing over the next few days and you'll be joining me over the course of this one video, however long uh, you intend to watch it for, whether in bits or in one go, up to you. But this will be a further exploration of my love of Japanese cinema. Where did it start it would be a good thing to kind of open this video with. For me, I think it started... Um, with Seven Samurai, um, and I'd seen Japanese films before, but for me in 2011, uh, I was doing the first epic film challenge, and I thought to myself, ah, you know, I want to challenge myself. I don't want to be watching, you know, just Nightmare on Elm Street films, as fun as they are. I want to start watching some classics, you know. And I remembered that my dad uh, had always watched the film Seven Samurai. I'd seen it on late night BBC TV once, and kind of watched a few minutes, and thought, oh, it looks old and boring. But at this point in my life, 2011, you know, I was really starting to be a bit more open-minded about films. And so I checked it out and fell in love with it. And it just captivated me from start to finish. And it was a three and a half hour long film. And then I thought, well, what, what else has this guy done? Of course, Akira Kurosawa was the guy who directed Seven Samurai back in 1954. I checked out some of his other films like High and Low, Yojimbo, Sanjuro, Hidden Fortress, um, Throne of Blood, you know, Rashomon. And at high and low, did I mention that? And I was just like, wow, this guy is amazing. Ron, uh, Ikiru, you know, it, the list goes on and on. And I was like, wow, this guy is amazing. And then I thought to myself, wow, there's got to be other great Japanese directors out there also. And so in my uh, Unseen Classics marathon, I watched uh, Igetsu Monogatari by... Um, oh, who's that by? I forget. Was it Ozu or Mizuguchi? See, I'm not an absolute uh, expert on Japanese... Yeah, by Kenji Mizuguchi, um, and I thought that film was incredible as well. And I've also recently got into the world of uh, anime and Studio Ghibli films over the past year or so, and more on that uh, very shortly. But th this, I'm, I'm so excited for this marathon. Again, I'm not going to be do doing it all in one go or anything, but whenever I get the chance, I'll be getting through all the films I've got lined up, and I'm going to come on camera and talk about them. It's just going to be amazing. It really is. I, I can't see myself being disappointed by this this uh, Japanathon because I have so many great films lined up uh, from what I've read and from what I know. You know, these films are held in high regard and they're from some of the best filmmakers. Um, you know, from like Imamuru to Mizuguchi to 
Ozu to Miyazaki to Kobayashi Kurosawa. Cannot wait to check out all the films I've got lined up for this and uh, with the exception of one they're all going to be first watches and that's what I love to do on marathon videos is to watch as many films I haven't seen before because there's nothing quite like watching a film you've never seen before and it's a masterpiece and you think wow that is what films are all about and I, I just know there's going to be at least one of those in this bunch so very excited um, and to kind of just do it you know one after the other you know I'll probably watch maybe two or three films at a time in this marathon uh, as I go along so it just maximizes it you know I mean I guess some would say maybe you should watch a film and be like wow that was amazing and then just leave it you know for a few days just to digest it and I certainly would argue for that in some cases but um you know there there is something quite special about watching loads of them in a row that just uh it's almost like you're getting a fix you know it's like you're an, a movie addict and it's just like I just want to see more and more so the one I'm going to kick off with is probably the one I think I'm least likely to love and that's because it's uh I don't think it's really touted as a as a great film now I'm going to spoil this whole video you know for people who don't really want to know what films are coming up but I think the film I'm going to end this whole thing on is uh Sancho Deu or Sancho the Bailiff uh, which is by uh, Mizuguchi. And I know this is a very uh, popular film. People hold it in very high regard. So that's the film we're going to end on. Now this Blu-ray from Massive Cinema in the UK, Eureka, uh, features a bonus film uh, called uh, Gion Biashi. Uh, Gion Biashi is a drama set in the world of the geisha, contrasting two different types of geisha. Um, Iko, a 16-year-old orphan who wishes to be taken in and trained, and Mia Haru, an older, more experienced geisha who agrees to mentor the younger woman, uh, living under the same roof in difficult personal circumstances, a fascinating insight into the lives of geisha in 1950s Japan. Now, looking at the films I have ready for this so far, I don't think there's going to be one like this, so I think it'd be cool to start with just a, a fairly low-key drama. It's only about 85 minutes, so I'm going to ease myself gently into this and uh, and start with uh, Gion Biashi, which is um, the bonus film on this Blu-ray, I guess you could say. If you can see that on camera, then I'll try and get the lights a bit better later on. But there you go. Gion Biashi is the first film of Japanathon. Let's get right to it and start this really cool thing. I'm really, really, really excited. Okay, so here we are. The uh, very simple and uh, and silent menu from uh, the Master Cinema of the Blu-ray, but very nice and elegant. And as you can see, that this Blu-ray has Sanchu Deyo at the top here. You can play the film. But we'll be going with Gion Biashi first off um, and then coming back to Sancho Deo at the very end, so it'll be a cool little bookend, but uh, yeah, let's do it with English subtitles, obviously, Gion Biashi. One thing I don't like about the uh, the PS4 controller is this little blue bar you can't turn off, so I have to flip it around so it's not reflected in the TV during the film. Wow, this looks to be in very bad condition. But nonetheless, I will strive on and hopefully uh, enjoy the film. So I'll catch up with you very soon. Okay, I just got done watching uh, Gion Biashi or Gion Biashi. I don't know how you pronounce it uh, exactly. Um, but yeah, uh, one of Mizuguchi's last films. Uh, this is part of the late Mizuguchi box set that uh, is now out of print. Um, and yeah, I... I guess it was kind of exactly as I was expecting it. Um, you know, Mizuguchi again, one of the greats, and it was shot very well. I mean, there was there was some, you know, just certain shots that to me were just absolutely beautiful, and you know, not in maybe a sense that you'd kind of a normal person would look at anything, but just like just very precisely constructed, um, framed, you know, perfectly, you know, and just some of the just the locations, you know, these little back alleys and the, the Japanese architecture and stuff, I just find so appealing and interesting to look at. So for me, it's just, uh, I always find the, the scenery in these films brilliant, but it's set in the, you know, in present day when it was made in the 50s, it came out in 1953, the year before Sanchu Deu, and it's about, as I said earlier, um, a young uh, training uh, geisha who kind of um, is teamed with an older more experienced geisha who's kind of like you know I'll show you the ropes kind of thing you know but she kind of is begging for it to be honest because um, her mother's died and uh, you know her father is she has a troubled relationship with her father and stuff like that so she gets taken in by this uh, older geisha um, named um, uh, Miyaharu and basically you know she's you know she's involved in you know her, Miyaharu's mother 
um, kind of arranges things with her sometimes and there's like, it's actually gets a little bit complicated but basically there's some businessmen who you know uh, pay for the services of geishas um, uh, you know for companionship uh, you know for uh, for fun and also for sex obviously um, an interesting level I did actually watch the um, there's a little bit of not a documentary but a, uh, a video essay from Tony Raines who's a huge um, Japanese cinema um, aficionado and expert and uh, he appears on many of these DVDs and Blu-rays talking about Japanese films um, and he s says that you know uh, earlier than the 50s even you know the 30s um, they weren't really seen as prostitutes it was more of a you pay for the companionship and you know behind closed doors if you know if sex happens it happens but you know it's not a uh, it's not a given, you know, it's not what you're paying for, whereas he, he said that around the time of the 50s that kind of what it was and almost anyone could be a geisha. And I find it interesting that, you know, the the, the, the younger character, the girl, uh, Iko, uh, she gets given a, it's confusing because she gets given a, her geisha name and she gets called by her real name and her geisha name a lot, so it's hard to keep track sometimes with the subtitles, but uh, Iko, she... Um, she wants to be a geisha just to kind of uh, just make something of her life, I guess. Um, but she doesn't agree with the fact that you know any man can just pay for her and have sex with her. She doesn't really, um, you know, uh, feel comfortable with that. She even brings up one of the older older women, uh, you know, around the area, and she says, you know, surely it's against the law if they force themselves on me, right? And the woman's like, well, I suppose technically. And she's like, well, if they do that, I can sue them, right? And so it's kind of about the what it was to be a geisha back then, I guess, and also um, the older geisha in the film. You know, she comes across in the beginning as you know very street smart and very you know um, knows her stuff. But as the film goes on, you realise she's just as um, lost as the sixteen-year-old in the film, uh, and just as helpless in a way. You know, even though she has puts a bit of a front on and stuff. And it's all about money, and you know, there's these businessmen who one of them wants uh, Miyaharu, and she doesn't want him. Um, and because she's turning him down, she is jeopardizing this business deal that could cost you know 80 million yen and stuff. So she gets pressured to basically, again, prostitute herself uh, for you know more money, and to not not affect negatively this bigger thing that's going on. So it was interesting. I wouldn't say it was great. It was almost great, but it was very very good. Um, I would say three and a half out of five, uh, possibly, um, I suppose, seven, seven and a half out of ten, something like that. I really, really enjoyed it. Very good. Um, would probably watch it again as well. Again, shot very well. I really enjoyed the drama. Didn't really get to me, you know, that it's definitely a mel melodramatic film, but it didn't really move me at all. So maybe I'd even knock it down to like a seven out of ten, perhaps. And yeah, but that's the three and a half out of five, maybe even three out of five. It's still very good, you know. Um, but uh, ultimately, it was um, it lacked something, I think. But it still had those sensibilities that I really enjoy in Japanese films. So definitely enjoyed it. Um, it just didn't uh, take it to that next level for me, I think. But I did enjoy the characters. I found them interesting. I found the uh, you know the, the the main character, the sixteen year old. I found her kind of questioning of what uh, geisha was and kind of what she should or shouldn't be doing was interesting. Maybe could have been explored a little bit more, I think. But um, I enjoyed it nonetheless. The next film is um, a very interesting uh, leap from you know the the 1950s uh, period drama into the 1990s anime fantasy epic. Um, it's the only anime film I'll be watching in this Japanathon, and again, it's the uh, the most recent film that will be in this Japanathon as well, and it is Princess Mononoke by Hayao Miyazaki, who I consider to be one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. And I include live action in that, you know, not just animation. And I almost feel like there's a stigma around enjoying animated films to that degree because, you know, I, I've fallen in love with Hayao Miyazaki's films. I'm exploring more anime films slowly, but for me, he just has a perfect filmography. Every film that he's made is uh, either great to legit masterpiece. You know, he's made 11 films, I've seen all of them, and I just love every single one of them. He just doesn't have a flaw in his filmography, or, or a weak point. I think. Well, I guess there's weaker, weaker films, but even the weakest film that he's made, I think, is still just brilliant. So, uh, you know, my mum would say like, oh, you know, 
it's not really a film, is it? It's a cartoon. I'm like, what? You know? I even talked to my little brother Tommy on Scope the other day, and he was asking asking me what my favorite film was. I was thinking, hmm. And he goes, oh, that's not a cartoon, because he knew I was going to say something like this, even though I wasn't. But you know. Uh, so even you know, a, like a nine year old boy is getting exasperated with my love for animated films. Um, but again, I wouldn't go that far with Disney films even, but for me the these Studio Ghibli films, in particular the ones by Hayao Miyazaki, are just there's something about them that I just absolutely adore. And this one is the first one I ever saw. Uh, and I saw it just over five years ago, so it's been a long time. I don't remember too much about it. I remember enjoying it at the time. I think I was slightly drunk. That was back when I used to, to drink. Uh, not that I used to drink a lot, but you know, I would have a drink every like four months or something like that. Um, I haven't had a drink in almost three years, yeah, I'm not really an alcohol guy, but at the time I had a drink and uh, a few drinks and so I'm looking forward to watching this with a clear head and to fully take it in, uh, now being a huge Miyazaki, I didn't know who Miyazaki was when I first saw this, and this will be kind of the end of it for me, kind of rounding off uh, this past year and a half where I've watched all of his films and cannot wait to see on Blu-ray in particular and uh, give you my, th my full thoughts on it, but it is a fantasy epic and uh, I think it's really long actually, it's like over two hours, so I think we're going to do that and then go to bed uh, for, for, the, for today anyway, obviously the video will continue and there won't be any gap for you guys or waiting to see the rest of the video. Um, the Star Wars of Animated Features by New York Post. Hmm, interesting. I would almost go with that I think. But again, I look forward to checking it out and uh, you know, I will be watching of course the Japanese language version. There is an English dub by Disney featuring Claire Danes, Minnie Driver, Billy Crudup and Gillian Anderson. But I will, uh, in, in fact, be going with the, uh, of course, the original Japanese version. So, Princess Mononoke, let's do it. Okay, so it's the next day, and uh, I did watch all of Princess Mononoke last night, and then went straight to sleep, basically. I even put the film on again as I went to sleep, to kind of have background entertainment to listen to as I fell asleep, and it was great. Um, the film was, uh, I remembered more of it than I thought I did. Um, the, every time like a, a specific scene would come up, I'd go, oh yeah, I remember that bit. Um, so a lot of it I had kind of forgotten, but for the most part, you know, um, it, it had stuck with me. I just needed to have my memory jogged. Uh, but as far as like the, the plot goes, uh, I really hadn't really remembered the finer details of it. So it revolves around this boy, um, I, I guess a samurai boy, and this is a kind of period fantasy film. Uh, it's set hundreds of years in the past. Um, I guess around the Iron Age, that kind of thing. Um, you know, people were using swords and bow and arrows, but you know, guns had, or muskets had just started to become made and that kind of thing. Um, and you could very well, you know, take some elements away from this film, and it could be a completely serious kind of uh, period drama. But uh, really, uh, it has very fantastical elements to it, and it is really, it's, it's like a, I guess it's an environmental film in a way. Um, but it's also a film that you just can't label. You really can't label this film, and that is something that I love about it. Um, so you have the main character, Ashitaka, who, young samurai boy, um, and the film puts you right in the action as well. It drops you right in at the deep end, you know. Uh, some of Miyazaki's other epic films, they take a while to get going, you know, uh, which isn't a bad thing by any means, but this one just really just straight in, and this is the longest film he's ever made. It is two hours and 13 minutes long, but it just gets going straight away. Basically, Ashitaka... Um, a, kind of a guy in a watchtower in his little his home village spots this thing in the woods and so Ashitaka basically goes after it and it's this huge demon with uh, writhing like snake-like tentacles uh, covering it. It's like a big mass of just like uh, a disgusting you know mess basically. It's, it's really horrid and inside is this wild boar who has become uh, possessed by this uh, this demon I guess and it's you know, rampaging towards Ashitaka's home village, his town, and you know, there's women there, and you know, they will have no chance, they'll all get killed and slaughtered, so Ashitaka takes it upon himself to chase after this demon and kill it with an arrow through uh, the eye. Um, but one of these tentacles latches itself onto Ashitaka's right forearm, and it kind of curses him, so he kills the demon, but he has effectively killed himself as well. And a wise old woman, the oracle of the, the village, tells him that it will you know, it'll eat its way into his bones and he will die. So, he can travel into the west and there may be an answer for him, but ultimately he'll have to look through unclouded eyes and, um, you know, basically see what the future holds for him, basically. And, you know, they even say, you know, we can't even watch you go. See ya, you know. So, he cuts off his top knot, which is, again, very symbolic, and 
goes off on his own with his um, with his trusty. Um, it's kind of like a cross between an elk and a deer. Um, it's kind of like his companion. I don't know if you can figure out what the name is, but you know, joins him along the journey. So he goes off and starts to see what's going on. You know, and there's lots of lots of characters in the film, lots of groups. Um, and I've already forgotten one of the main characters of the film. Uh, and it's not going to be on the back, is it? Damn. Okay. Um, it's a woman um, who's kind of like the leader of the this iron town. This town that, uh, you know, they have, they, they make iron and that kind of thing. And they're basically using up the natural resources to do this. Uh, Aboshi? Lady Aboshi? I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And she basically wants to, um, you know, rip the trees down you know, uh, reap the, you know, the natural resources from the earth, make the iron and, you know, just build a better world for her people. Um, and, you know, she's willing to kill animals in the process. And there are animals in the film, such as this one right here, uh, Moro, who are not really, I mean, they're huge animals. They're much bigger than normal animals and they're spirits and they're, you know, supernatural beings. And there is a deer god who kind of rules over the forest, um, a very strange, enigmatic creature who might be the answer to all of Ashitaka's problems, but also Lady Aboshi wants to take down and kill this deer god because then she can have the forest for herself to reap everything that it has, uh, but again, to make a better life for her people. So for me, what I absolutely adore about this film is there are no villains. Um, there are acts of violence, you know, there are definitely acts of, uh, uh, you know, well, yeah, acts of violence basically, an intent to kill, but there is no one in this film, I don't think, who sees themselves as evil or is really acting maliciously. Everyone has their own agenda and everyone believes that they're right. Lady Aboshi believes she's doing the right thing for her people. And if, you know, if, you if a few wolves, uh, spirit wolves have to die, if a deer god has to die for her people to survive, then that is what it will take. You have these other characters who also have their own agendas and things, and there's lots of things going on. Again, it's a very long film. And Ashitaka is a great character, you know, very strong, and, um, you know, Miyazaki usually goes for the you know, lead heroine in his film, so it's interesting to see a, a real strong male character in one of his films. But the, 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 the titular princess Mononoke is this girl here, San, um, and the people outside call her Princess Mononoke, and uh, she's a great character as well, another great character, and she basically is the daughter of this spirit wolf. Um, the adopted daughter, and she's kind of, you know, almost, she doesn't think of herself as human, you know, she thinks of herself as a wolf, so it's a very interesting dynamic, and uh, Ashitaka really um, finds himself drawn to her in many ways, and uh, intrigued by her, and um, they, they form an interesting relationship, but it's an amazing film, it really is, and it says so much, I mean, it, it's such a deep film, there's so many things that you can take away from it. Again, the, the environmentalism, you know, and uh, you can kind of just, it's almost like a fable as well. Like you can kind of take bits of it and look at it in, in terms of the world today, you know, uh, the humans just kind of devouring the earth, you know, and not respecting it. And uh, I love that side of it. And I love how, again, you can look at it as a straight up, just kind of, you know, uh, war film. Yeah, there's a lot of war in it. And that is his most violent film as well. I think this is a, Wow, it's only a PG. I would have thought it would be at least a 12. It says general viewing, but some scenes may be unsuitable for children. There's a lot of a couple of decapitations in this. Guys who get their arms chopped off. Um, you know, uh, scenes of bodies lying around. You know, uh, death. I mean, it's yeah, it's quite a, a dire film in a way, but uh, it's visually beautiful. And again, it's always interesting when you have that beautiful visual to go along with you know, kind of harrowing images. Um, I love how Miyazaki portrayed the wolves in the film. They're amazing. You know, you can look at them in some shots and say, "Wow, they they're gorgeous. They're majestic. They're beautiful." And then you can look at them in the close-up scenes where they have conversations with the other characters, and you think, "Wow, that's a that's a horrifying, terrifying creature." I mean, the shot here, you can see all the lines on his face just look so nasty and just ready to kill. And they are really violent animals, and they really just want to just kill humans, bite their heads off. Just rip them to shreds and kill them. But, you know, you can almost understand why they feel that way because of the way most of the humans act. But you get to see both sides of it, and that's what I love about the film. Um, along with, again, 
to overuse the word, the beautiful scenery, the beautiful music. Oh my god, Joe Hisaishi, who's done the scores for almost all of Miyazaki's films. The score for this is unbelievable. It's it's breathtaking. It really, I just, oh, I love it so much. It really fits the the grand scope of the film and everything that goes along with it. But it's such a ride. It's a fantastic film. You definitely need to check it out. Um, whether you like anime or not, whether you like animated films or not, it's definitely one of those films you need to see. It can make you reevaluate your thoughts on it. You know, um, it really is a special film, and it's not just like oh, it's a good animated film. No, it is a great film. Period. So. Princess Mononoke, highly recommended. I enjoyed it much more the second time round. Now I've become more of a fan and accustomed to Miyazaki's style, um, and gave it my full attention as well. Adored it, absolutely adored it. It's, an, it's another 10 out of 10 Miyazaki film, a masterpiece, and I think I'd probably put it in my top 5 films from him as well, in terms of my favourites. But I think overall, this might be his best film. It really might be his best film. Um, I don't rate Spirited Away that highly as one of his best films. Um, my favorite film of his, Paul Caruso, is not his best film. Um, so I, yeah, I think this is Miyazaki's finest, finest hour. I really do. So Princess Mononoke, absolutely fantastic. Okay, so the next film I'll be watching in the Japanathon is one I've been looking forward to for a very, 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 very long time, and uh, it kind of seems like around the early fifties when this one came out, uh, nineteen fifty-three. The early 1950s, um, there were kind of three films that were made by Japanese directors that were seen as kind of like the, you know, the, the pillars of excellence in terms of uh, Japanese cinema, and that would be Seven Samurai from Akira Kurosawa, Igetsu Monogatari from um, uh, Mizuguchi, and Tokyo Story by Ozu. Um, I what's his full name? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Yasujiro Ozu. Uh, Tokyo Story, uh, this is supposed to be a very good film, 1953, um, got it for Christmas from my nan, really looking forward to checking it out, it's supposed to be a very slow film, and again I've heard about Ozu's style, can't wait to kind of see it for myself basically, um, it says a constant fixture in critics polls, Yasujiro Ozu's most enduring masterpiece Tokyo Story, it's a beautifully nuanced exploration of um, Duty, expectation, and regret. From the simple tale of an elderly husband and wife's visit to Tokyo to see their grown-up children, Ozu draws a compelling contrast between the measured dignity of age and the hurried insensitivity of a younger generation. So, yeah, it's, uh, again, about uh, two parents. I mean, I'll get into it once I've seen the film, I guess, but um, really looking forward to it. And I know that um, one of the main characters in the film is played by Setsuku Hara, um, I believe that's who this woman is here on the front cover, and uh, she's in a few of Akira Kurosawa's early films, uh, particularly I think it's uh, One Wonderful Sunday or something like that, um, which I reviewed a while ago on the Blurry Brothers channel, um, and it, it was slow, but I really liked her in it, and it got me by the end, so I'm very interested to see her in a film like this, which is acclaimed as, again, one of these masterpieces, so without any further ado, let's get right on with it, Tokyo Story and uh, see what it's like. Alright, here we go, Tokyo Story, obviously with the uh, the old English subtitles on. Let's uh, see if it's uh, worth the hype. Okay, so, Tokyo Story, <laughs> mm, yeah, let me just uh, wipe the remnants of the tears that were formulating in my eyes in those last 15 minutes, um, another long film, again, 2 hours and 15 minutes, um, and this is a film I think that, sadly not a lot of people would have the patience for, um, it's a very slow film. Uh, and again, I've heard of Ozu's direction, and it was very uh, distinctive in this film. Uh, a lot of low angles, static shots. Um, I believe there's only one, uh, or maybe a few shots, the way the <coughs> the camera actually moves in the film. Uh, but for the most part, it's literally just static shots, and you just witness the conversations and the actions and the everyday lives of all the characters involved in the film. And there are a lot of them. We have um, an elderly couple, a man and a woman. And they're just referred to by everyone, you know, even their in their, you know, 
daughters and son-in-laws as you know mother and father so for all intents and purposes the, the mother and father are the two main characters they live out in somewhere in Japan and uh, it takes them a day to travel down to Tokyo or up to Tokyo I don't know where it is in relation to the geography of Japan but it takes them about a day to travel to Tokyo to see uh, you know their kids um, their youngest daughter Kyoko lives with them um, but all the other, their other kids, I think they have four others, uh, they live in Tokyo. And they're kind of, you know, they're getting on now in their 30s. And I'd say one of them was definitely in their 40s. And they have their own families and their own lives and everything. And they turn up to, you know, see their kids. And it becomes apparent quite quickly that their kids aren't that really um, thrilled to, you know, receive their parents as guests. Um, at least not in the long term. Uh, I mean, they they only come to stay for a week, but you know that is is too long for their kids. You know, they've got their own lives, and they're not really too interested in entertaining their you know elderly parents or making the most out of them. And a, a, one member of the family who definitely does appreciate them and does want to spend time with them and genuinely does take joy out of being with them and showing them around Tokyo is Noriko, who's played by. Um, uh, Setsuku Hara. And I said earlier, I thought Setsuku Hara was in uh, one, uh, I've got it here actually on my laptop, I'll get the right title. I thought I'd seen her in One Wonderful Sunday, an Akira Kurosawa film. I've actually not seen that film, that's the next one for me to watch in his filmography, chronologically. But it was a 1946 film called No Regrets for Our Youth. That was the film I'd seen Setsuku Hara in, I thought she was great in that. And she's fantastic in this film as Noriko, she's on the front cover there with uh, the father. And she was great. Really, really enjoyed her in the film. And she is, she was the she's the widowed daughter-in-law to the mother and father. Um, one of their sons died in the war. And again, this is very much about showing uh, you know post-war Japan. And I guess the you know uh, the passing of a generation. Time is changing. You know, uh, people are getting busier. And uh, also, you know, the idea of Noriko. You know, it's been eight years since her. Her husband passed and you know she still has the picture up in her apartment she still lives alone and you know the mother and father they want her to to move on they want her to break away from the Japanese tradition of you know if you're wid if you're widowed then that's it you know you don't remarry but they want her to be happy and they can see that she is um, a much nicer person than their their kids you know and it's about you know how your kids grow up and how your kids change and have their own lives and how you know the older you get sometimes for some people at least um, your parents become less and less important and maybe you can take them for granted I think this is a, definitely a 10 out of 10 film for me it's my kind of film it had me hooked from start to finish you know, there'd be shots where nothing's happening, you know, you, you just seeing people walking around a house just doing the dishes, but it was just, it made it feel so much more authentic, it made it feel so much more real, I believed everything I was seeing, you know, I believed that the world was black and white back in 1953 in Tokyo, Japan, I just believed everything that I saw on screen. The actors who played the mother and father were just so brilliant, so kind and, and funny and, you know, just a heartwarming couple to watch on screen. You, you totally bought that they'd been married their whole lives and had such a an affection for each other. It might also be a bit of a culture shock for some people who don't watch too many Japanese films to see, you know, and even me at times, I'm thinking, you know, hey, you haven't seen your kids in a while, you know, give them a hug, you know, but it's just not the thing that you, they do in Japan, you know, you, you bow the head or, you know, it's... um it's different, you know, it's, it's completely different, it's it's a, a culture that's on the other side of the world, uh, you know, well, for people like me anyway, and, you know, again, this is, again, 60 years into the past now, so, again, things are different all over again, so it's just, um, it's very interesting, it's a snapshot of a certain period of time, a certain culture, but also I think its themes are universal in terms of relationships with your parents, and, you know, even grandkids, you know, or your you know how your kids interact with your parents and things like that um, and also it's you know there's themes of uh, of being selfish and again I don't get too too much into it but basically uh, yeah and no, I'll, I'll leave it I'll leave it I don't want to spoil it for anyone but um, yeah I just think there's, there's this very rich film there's lots of th layers to it um, the performances are fantastic and uh, you know 
yeah, I, I I really do recommend it. You know, if if people like Japanese films, it is a must see film, a masterpiece, a unlikely masterpiece. You know, I mean, it's I mean, I look at a film like Seven Samurai, and it's like you know, it's this three and a half hour epic about you know, uh, samurai defending a village. There's action, you know, there's sword play, there's you know, just these great scenes and everything. And this is literally just some you know, just a family's life, you know in very simple terms but you know uh, there's scenes in there I think that anyone can relate to I, I certainly could you know obviously not in terms of the Japanese culture but just the way you can sometimes be with your family and maybe take them for granted and not make the most of every situation and things like that um, very very moving film definitely got me at the end uh, and also you know, some of these films they tend to go into kind of melodrama, which is actually fine because I actually I'm a bit of a sucker for a melodrama if it's done right and it's not over the top uh, or not too over the top. Um, but I think that where this film got me and almost made me cry was in such a you know I, if I'd seen the scene that really got me at the end out of context, it probably wouldn't have done anything to me. But because you spend the, all this time with the characters. You know, it just, um, you kind of feel like, you know, you're a fly on the wall. You know, it's almost documentary style, you know, the way it's shot. Uh, well, not the way it's shot, but the way it feels, you know. I, again, I just bought into the family so much, you know, and uh, every character had their own little, you know. And there'd be little bits, you know, like where one, one of their daughters is a hairdresser and uh, her parents come in and one of her customers says, you know, who's that? And she just turned around and she says, oh, just, just some friends, you know. Oh, I just broke my fucking heart, you know, that that she was too, she didn't want to say that they were her parents, and it, oh, whew. you know, moments like that, and also, but there's there's also fun moments, and and there's a lot to it. Definitely, a brilliant film. I can't see any film in this in Japanathon topping this for me. Um, you know, Princess Mononoke would probably come close, but now this is just yeah, this is top of the line, fantastic, absolute classic highly recommended. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do for the next film yet, I'm going to make some dinner first so uh, I'll reconvene and get back to you on what the next film is but um, as far as I'm concerned, um, I hope not, but as far as I'm concerned it's all downhill from here. Tokyo Story, fantastic. And actually before I even get on to deciding what next film I'm going to watch, there was a little bit of Princess Mononoke I really wanted to touch on that I didn't before. Um, I've got to think of that as well, right okay. Take a breather. Going back to earlier when I watched uh, Guillaume Biashi. I can't remember if I said, because I, f I remember filming the credits and it was in really bad condition. I'm not sure if I said or not that uh, the rest of the film looked great. You know, um, it was just the credits that were really ropey. So obviously it was some issue with the film print or something for, for just the credits at the beginning. I don't know. Just want to get that out of the way. But also Princess Mononoke. Um, <sighs> Yeah, I feel like I'm just sat here, just like, just like, basically just jerking off over these films. But there was a moment in this I really want to talk about that I thought was brilliant. And again, it's down to that Japanese kind of style of storytelling, and well, at least some you know uh, directors and storytellers from Japan, uh, they're not afraid to linger on a moment, uh, even if it's not exciting or you know mo propels the plot forward. They'll hold on a moment, and it just makes it more, not more real, I guess, in a film like this, but where it's all fantasy and stuff, but uh, there's a scene where Ashitaka, who's the main character in the film, and uh, Princess Mononoke, San, uh, Ashitaka's injured, and San has this, um, some, some kind of like, uh, uh, dried kind of meat that she's trying to make him eat, and he's so weak that he can't, he can't chew it. So, you know, her being this kind of wolf girl, you know, she just, well, okay, so she chews it in her own mouth, and then she leans down, and she basically spits it back into his mouth. Now that is a scene where I, people could start laughing, thinking, oh, that's ridiculous, right? And it goes on for about a minute, you know? She does it, she puts it into it. You don't see it happening, you just see her lean forward with her, with her mouth, as if she's kissing him. Um, but obviously you understand what she's doing. She leans up, she gets breaks some more off, she chews it, she chews it, she bends down, she does it again, the angle changes, and just, again, it's just something that Normally, we'd just hit the cutting room floor, you know, and in a case with animation film, you wouldn't even an get to animating stages, but Miyazaki obviously felt the need to hold on that moment 
and I loved it, I really loved it, it was a really sweet moment to me. So again, just wanted to talk about that from Princess Mononoke and uh, get that out of the way because it was bugging me that I didn't mention it because I really wanted to, but uh, obviously I didn't film the review um, directly after I'd watched the film and went to bed first. So, okay, on with the next film, um, whenever the next cut in the video is. Alright, so uh, yeah, it's now a day later, um, and I think this whole Japanathon is going to have to take place over about a week and not a few days as I was planning. Uh, just other stuff coming up really, but that's fine by me because uh, Tokyo Story really took it out of me. Um, and even now I'm still feeling the effects of it. Um, it's a very profound film that I adored, and the, the more I think about it, the more I just love it. And I'm not sure if I fully expressed how I felt about it, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just the, the emotions in the film and how they weren't overplayed, um, you know, for me is what made it so special as well. But anyway, uh, I'm going to jump right into a film I hadn't even considered watching for this marathon, so this is kind of a last minute inclusion into my list of films that I was um, planning on checking out, and that is Youth of the Beast, uh, which is a 60s Yakuza film. So completely out of uh, the style that I was kind of expecting from this marathon in terms of the films that I had planned. Um, this one's 1963, a film by Seijun Suzuki, uh, the film that he considered to be the first to execute his fully formed kaleidoscopic style. Uh, Youth of the Beast is a Yakuza tale with a premise like Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo, one of my favourite films, whereby neither of two rival gangs can claim moral superiority over the other. Uh, the film stars Suzuki's iconic 60s regular Joe Shishido with his dare you to call them out artificial cheek implants like a new kind of screen star blasphemy. I'm not sure I quite understood that sentence. You let me know. Uh, there are drug addled whores, gunfights in a toxin hued apocalypse, and at least one alien landscape, a mind searing eruption of sulfur yellow desert like an action figure playset reeking of sex. Who wrote this shit? <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, let's just get right on with it. Uh, it's only an hour and a half, so I can kind of blast it out and, uh, and then get on to the, the rest of the kind of scheduled films. I'm definitely going to watch another one tonight at least. Um, which I have planned up on the shelf ready to go. So let's get right into Youth of the Beast and uh, I'll give you my thoughts uh, on the other side. On the other side? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, Youth of the Beast. <laughs> um, very interesting film, to say the least. Uh, very interesting. Um, this might very well be my least favourite Masters cinema release so far. Um, I've said many times I'm a huge collector of these uh, Blu-rays, Eureka Masters Cinema in the UK, pretty much the UK Criterion collection, that I've never seen a film in the Masters Cinema range that I haven't thought was at least very, very good. And this was just um, pretty good, I'd say. wasn't bad, um, but it's very different. Um, very unconventional film. Um, it stars uh, this guy here. Remember I was talking about the... Uh, the very weird summary on the back, Joe Shishido. Um, there you go. Day to call them out, artificial cheek implants. So yeah, um, this guy on the the cover here, the star of the film, uh, Joe in the film. I think it's his actual name as well. Yeah, Joe Shishido. Uh, Joe, uh, he had artificial cheek implants to make himself um, be a more attractive leading man in the late fifties, and this is a film from the early sixties. And I don't know if you can tell there, he has a quite a his cheeks stand out a lot. It gives him kind of an appearance of a chipmunk at times. Um, it's quite odd, to be to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but nonetheless, uh, he's a guy who comes in to this kind of Yakuza scene. And again, there's two kind of separate gangs, and he kind of plays them off against each other and kind of joins both of them, basically, and is infiltrating them for a reason you're not quite sure, and you find out later on that he has a very specific reason for playing these get gangs off each other, and he's trying to find out who killed someone who had a, uh, a certain importance in his life at one point. So uh, the film opens with this this supposed double suicide, and uh, maybe not all is as it seems, and that's where Joe comes in to try and figure it out. Um, but his motives don't get revealed until, until much later on in the film. Now, it's an hour and a half film. It felt quite long, but at the same time, the pace is almost breakneck. I mean, there are scenes where he'll be walking around, and he's... You know, he's, or any character to be walking around and talking about something, then all of a sudden it's straight to another scene. I mean, it just it cuts out all the fat, the kind of you know the the, the motions of of you know, linking action to you know someone walking into another room. It'll just Suzuki will just cut that out, and you'll be in the next room immediately, and it's like bang, or a car will be driving and there's music, and then bang, you're straight into this other scene, and it's like you know, 
uh, hard to keep up with at times, and with all the characters in it, and all you know, two different gangs. There's nothing to really distinguish them from each from each other. And uh, again, I hate to get into that thing where you know, um, or to even say it, you know, out loud. To be honest, but um, you know, um, a lot of these, you know, Asian actors that a lot of them look similar. And so, you know, it just is what it is, you know, it's not one of these racist things, it's just the fact that it's hard to sometimes keep track of the characters, uh, you know, is that from that gang or is that from the other gang, especially when Joe is trying to, uh, you know, uh, be a part of both of them at the same time, it can be kind of confusing at times. But I did enjoy the unconventional nature of it, there's a great scene at the beginning that's in black and white and we see this, this red flower that is uh, in colour, and then the film bursts into colour and it's suddenly like, whoa, and then the music and it's... Really interesting uh, visual film, definitely style of a substance I'd say, uh, but overall towards the end I really liked where it was going, there was a bit of tension there and it had kind of got to the point where I knew enough about a certain few characters that the ending, the last 15-20 minutes for me were really interesting and I was invested in it by the end, so yeah I'd say it was pretty good, I'd say maybe 3 out of 5, you know, or um, oh, what would that be in, in sort of a, a 10 range, it probably made... Mm, Maybe maybe like a 6.5 out of 10, you know, it wasn't fantastic, it wasn't even really good. I don't know, maybe I'd have to watch it again, but I definitely loved the, even though it is a style of a substance kind of film, I did enjoy the style of it, and I did, I did enjoy the um, the kind of wacky nature of it. It's a bit over the top as well, um, but yeah, overall I did, I did really enjoy it, but I wouldn't say that it's a great film, if you get what I mean. So, there we go, Youth of the Beast. And the next film I'm going to be watching is... Um, exactly 20 years into the future from Youth of the Beast. It was released in 1983 and it is directed by Shohei Imamura and it is The Ballad of Nariyama. Uh, now I've heard things about this film um, and I'm very interested to see what it's like for myself. Um, it sounds very interesting. Let's read the back of the, uh, the Blu-ray. Again, another mass massive cinema release. In a small village in a, in a remote valley where the harshness of life dictates that survival overrules compassion, elderly widow Oren is approaching her 70th birthday, the age when village law says she must go up to the mythic Mount Nariyama to die. But there are several loose ends within her own family to tie up first. So it sounds like a very interesting uh, plot. And I remember reading the plot on Amazon and being really interested in this one. Um, so yeah, it's the first film I'll be watching by Shohei Im Imamura, and again, this is the first uh, Seijun Suzuki film I've watched, um, and uh, was there another first, yeah, another first Ozu film I watched as well, so again, getting a lot of first watches of particular Japanese directors into this marathon, which is good, and um, yeah, I'm definitely intrigued by this film, so I'm going to stick it on now, and I'll uh, reconvene when it's over, and we'll see uh, if I enjoyed it more than Youth of the Beast, and I've got a feeling I'm, I'm going to, so... Uh, yeah, I feel like this is more my kind of film, but we'll see. It could be completely different to what I'm expecting, so I'm kind of excited about that too. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Wow. <sighs> Alright, so that's that then. I think I'm gonna watch this Tony Raines little video first and then then we'll talk about it. Okay, so I have finished watching The Ballad of Nariyama and as you just heard, wow 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 wow. Yes, this was amazing. This was, to use the dreaded term, a masterpiece. This was a 10 out of 10, 5 out of 5, double, triple, quadruple thumbs up. Amazing film, absolutely loved it. Um, brilliant film. What other word can I use really to sum it up? Um, but as you know, as I said earlier, with the the summing up of the the plot, there is a woman called uh, Oren, who is sixty nine. She's approaching her seventieth birthday, and in the small village where they live, presumably uh, at some point in eighteen hundreds, uh, Japan, uh, in a mountain village. The tradition is when someone reaches 70, they are sent up Mount Nariyama to, to die, to control the population. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a tough life up there, basically. You know, food is scarce and fought over. You know, uh, if someone steals, the punishment is severe. The laws that govern the village are very strict, cruel and harsh. But amidst all that, there is a lot of life 
and fun in the film at, at times. It's a film with, you know, uh, you know, it, it, there's so much of life in it. You know, um, there's funny moments, there's heartfelt moments, there's shocking moments, um, there's uh, steamy moments. There's a lot of sex in the film. Well, not too much, you know. Um, but I guess it shows you the normal amount, you know. And again, I'm not really one of those people who like sex scenes in films. I think that, for the most part, there's no need for them. But in this one, I totally got why they were there. It was just showing that part of life in a way. Uh, and even, at times it was funny as well, and uh, it worked. Um, something that also kind of makes this film stand out is the use of uh, cinematography of wildlife. Um, many different animals that are kind of used to kind of show again the surrounding area and the wildlife but also to kind of juxtapose it with what's going on with the people in the story as well and there's even some brilliant shots in the film where you know in the foreground you've got an animal and in the background uh, you have uh, the action taking place with the humans and you kind of think wow how did they manage to get an owl to sit in that same spot for the, the minutes they needed for the shot or whatever some great stuff like that um, and I, you know, you know, it was just interesting, really interestingly shot, um, yeah, and acted. The, the acting was great as well. The, the lead actor is fantastic. Plays the son of Oren, and he's a very conflicted character. And uh, and the actress who played Oren as well was fantastic. And as I learned on the special features of this Blu-ray, uh, she was so committed to the role. I don't know if you can see there. Um, the lighting's not very good. And I can't be bothered to change it because I'm going to bed any second now. But I'm tired. But Basically, um, her four front teeth are missing. Um, I don't want to say how it happens, but it happens uh, in the first hour of the film. And it's there's a symbolic reason for it happening, and I, I really enjoyed that. And it was an important part of the story as well, um, and it really stood out. Uh, and I found out in the special features that the actress who plays Oren uh, agreed to have all of her four front teeth removed for the, for, for the role in the film. I mean, if that's not dedication, I don't know what is. I mean, that's crazy. Now I was thinking to myself, maybe she has no teeth to begin with, but apparently she wasn't as old as the character of Owen. She was maybe in her 50s when she made this. So, yeah, very dedicated. Obviously, she had uh, fake teeth put back in afterwards, but for the film, she was game to have them removed so that that part of the story could be uh, shown you know, as real as possible. And that's another thing that this film excels at, is how real it feels, how authentic it feels. And again, in looking into the making of it... Um, you find out that they spent, you know, about three years on this film, uh, you know, well over a year in production in terms of, uh, you know, they found where they're going to make the village and they uh, set it up and they filmed through all four seasons. So, you know, the, the film opens and the whole village, the whole mountainside is covered in snow and then the snow begins to melt and then, you know, the spring starts, then the summer, then the autumn. And the way they caught that was, you know, again, it's all in a real location. So... Uh, they just spent a year doing it basically and it really really paid off well because every every scene feels so real because it is real and it's on a real location and in some cases you get these amazing backdrops and some fantastic cinematography the, the film looks gorgeous um, and again there's a lot of things going on in the film lots of characters within the village and things that happen and there's one particular scene that I found just chilling just really disturbing and it wasn't you know it was kind of like an oh my god moment, like a holy shit, uh, which I usually kind of reserve for moments in films where it's like, you know, someone's head gets cut off or something like that. But this one was, it wasn't that graphic, but the idea of it, oh, it was chilling. And to see it unfold was horrible, but it, it kind of, again, it comes down to the way of life of these characters. And, um, but also the main, the main kind of plot of the film, you know, the, the, the elders being sent up the mountain to die, you kind of, again, uh, you juxtapose that in your own head, at least I did, with, you know, how you treat the, the old people in your own life, you know, um, in present day, I should say, you know, your grandparents, you know, do you, do you visit them often, you know, you send them off to a home and, you know, uh, that kind of thing, I think. Um, and apparently that's kind of what Imamura was was thinking of as well, because I had that thought in my head, and then I watched the, the Tony Raines interview on the, the Blu-ray, and he was saying that, um, Imamura once said that uh, he was almost thinking of filming an introduction to this film which would be in modern day Japan with um, a family dropping off their grandmother at an old people's home and the uh, not to spoil, well I don't know if spoiling this but you know 
uh, in terms of people who might buy this and, and are interested in looking at the special features, but uh, you know, they drop off their grandmother at the old people's home. They're okay, we'll come visit you soon. And then the grandmother sees another old lady at the at the uh, old people's home, and she says, "Oh, did they tell you that they'll come back and see you?" And she says, "Yeah, of course, of course they will." And the other old woman says, "Well, they always say that, but they never come." And he almost considered making that kind of prologue to the film before cutting into the you know the the 1800s uh, you know period where the film takes place. So again, that's kind of part of what he was going for. Um, but also for me, there's just so many things in it that are about uh, life in general. And while the way of life in this can seem so far from our own, it kind of, you can relate it to other things, I think. Uh, not not very strongly, I mean, you know, I'm not saying this is a film where you can look at it and it'll, you know, it'll be like, oh, it's changed my outlook on life. Not at all, but there's definitely things in it that make you think, I should say. But overall, it just felt so authentic and, you know, these are the actors and the people who made the film literally were just living on that mountain. Uh, no trailers, no fancy, you know, uh, uh, treatment, you know, they, they slugged through it and there's, I don't think this is spoiling much, um, I hope not anyway, but um, you know, Orin is destined to go up the mountain. Uh, I won't tell you what happens when she gets up the mountain or you know, uh, you know, anything involving the outcome of the film, but what I found so moving was her son carries her up the mountain and uh, I suppose that is the tradition and it's a very long sequence, well not very, well, in terms of like singular scenes, it is a very long sequence because it shows you how long it took took them to get up there, but also the just the the physical rigor of it. You know, the the actor who who plays the uh, the son, literally carrying this old the, the actress on his back, going scaling up this you know like angles like this up you know pure mountain sides you know just like scrabbling up rocks and you know clawing with his feet and his and his hands and you know it, there's no uh, acting involved in scenes like that, you, 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 they basically went through it and that really showed as well I think so you know I think it's it makes the argument for films being done you know in a, in a realistic way you know doing it for real doing it in a physical on a physical location doing it the way that it's supposed to be done you know not really cheating things and things like that although there are a few things that happen in the film where I'm like how do they pull that off because that, that can't have been real um, so obviously trickery going on, but for the most part, just the everyday, uh, you know, lifestyle. I think it just it seems so real and authentic, and I think I've used the words brilliant, real, authentic, and yeah, far too many times by now. I need to get a bigger vocabulary, I think. But overall, the Ballad of Dinariyama was a fantastic film that I'll definitely, definitely be revisiting many times in the future. I'm sure. Um, yeah, just fantastic. Highly recommend it. Uh, Massive Cinema, another great release. And I actually watched all the extras and I read everything in the, the booklet as well. Um, you know, it, it moved me to the point where I, I wanted to know everything about it that was, you know, that was there for me at the time. So, a great booklet as well from Eureka Massive Cinema. Some great stuff in it, you know, pictures, things like that. But also an interview with, oh, bit of a bit of a racy picture there. <laughs> But yeah, an interview with the um, the director, fantastic little booklet, and uh, the interview with Tony Raines was very insightful as well. So, top release, top film, I'm going to go to bed, and then the next time you see me will be another day, and I will uh, continue to watch some more Japanese films. So, yeah. Uh, it feels a bit like, it's, a, it's like a double, a double, uh, a double experience, because I started off with uh, Guillaume Biashi, which was, you know, a pretty good film, and then Tokyo Story, which oh, blew me away, and then today, tonight, you know, I did uh, Youth of the Beast, which, you know, was a pretty good film, and then this one, which just blew me away, so, uh, we'll see what two films I watch next, um, but I, I actually have no idea what I'm going to watch next, I have obviously a, in mind a fair few films, I just don't know which one to go with uh, when I pick this up, but uh, you'll know um, sooner than I know from this point in time, so uh, I'll just call uh, an end to this part of the video now, and uh, yeah, hope you're enjoying this so far. Okay, so it is time for the next film in the uh, Japanathon video. And where do you go from, you know, the Ballad of Nariyama? Where do you go from Tokyo Story and uh, Youth of the Beast? You go into a very long film, uh, a so called masterpiece. And again, that, w that word has been bandied around far too loosely in this video already, but. Uh, as it is, this is a film that has been hailed as a masterpiece, 
and it has been often referenced as a, a 9 hour film, a 10 hour film, an 11 hour film um, but for me I think it is, uh, well not for me, it's from what I've seen in what I'm, I'm about to watch it is uh, three and a half, three ten, so that's six hours forty, uh, almost ten hours, nine hours and forty minutes roughly. Made up of three films, it's a trilogy, it is called The Human Condition. Uh, it's directed by uh, Kobayashi, who uh, directed a film that I saw recently and was blown away by, which you may or may not see in the 24 hour movie marathon 4. But this trilogy, The Human Condition, um, is about a guy in the war and that's all I really know about it but the guy who's in it the lead character is played by an actor who, who I'm a very big fan of um, he's been in quite a few Kira Kurosawa films that I've enjoyed particularly his performances in um, films like High and Low, um, Yojimbo, Sanjuro, Ran uh, to name a few and also the Kobayashi film uh, that I saw a couple of weeks ago he was the lead in that as well, and so he's the lead in this film again, uh, The Human Condition, and it's an epic, you know. Uh, the first film is three and a half hours long, and I think that's about the same length as Seven Samurai, but with a story that's not as interesting or as exciting as Seven Samurai from what I've read from the description. So it might be tough going, but it's one I really want to tackle. Um, I really want to do it in one day and watch all three, but it's hard to find ten hours free time uh, to do anything in one sitting. So. Um, I'll do my best, but hopefully I'll at least get through the first part and not have to kind of, you know, uh, watch each film in segments. I want to at least watch each of the three films in one go and give it my full attention. So, without further ado, I'm going to crack straight on with uh, The Human Condition 1. I believe the subtitle is No Greater Love. So, I'll see you on the other side, and uh, I guess this, this whole section of the video will be quite fragmented because again I might not get to watch the second part for a few days and we'll see what happens so yeah let's just get right to it the human condition number one okay I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this I'm gonna get through this I'm determined to get through this right now okay the human condition it's been about a week since I watched it um, you know I spent four days watching the trilogy on the first day, uh, which was I think Friday, uh, no Saturday was it, Saturday I watched um, the first film in the trilogy, on Sunday I watched the second film, on Monday I watched the first part of the third film and on Tuesday I watched the second part of the third film and then I sat down and filmed a 45 minute review of all three of the films and I, I just felt like it wasn't enough but then I felt like it was too long and I was realizing that this video is getting too long as it is and I just thought this has got to be a way I can succinctly sum up these films and I couldn't, I just couldn't do it and then I watched a video uh, review of it um, by 99 Filmo and it was an over an hour long and it was fantastic and I thought I'm never going to be able to approach even you know halfway explaining myself as, as well as uh, as Joe did in that video um, and then I tried filming it again after 10 minutes I just I just couldn't talk anymore about it and it's just, I'm going to do it now, I'm going to get get over it and do it right now, okay? The Human Condition is an epic trilogy, or an epic film that's over nine and a half hours long. It's one through narrative, you follow one character through three different situations in the in the same kind of circumstance. And it's directed by Masaki Kobayashi, it was released in 1959, 1960 and 1961 in Japan, and stars uh, Tatsuya Nakadai as the main character, Kaji. The first film is called The Human Condition 1, No Greater Love. The second film is called Human Condition 2, Road to Eternity. And the third film is called Human Condition 3, A Soldier's Prayer. Now, each of the films is also split into two parts. You have an intermission in about an hour and a half into each film. So, you know, you have part 1, part 2, film 1, part 3, part 4, film 2, and then part 5, part 6, film 3. Okay, now that's out of the way. The film itself is set during the World War, World War II, uh, in not Japan, but in Manchuria, which was, uh, I believe, uh, Japanese-occupied China, which I knew nothing about. So again, I was taught stuff about history with these films. Um, but they're also based on a six-part novel uh, that was released in the late 50s by a Japanese author. And so that might explain why they're so long, because I think Kobayashi was so faithful to the books. Um, but either way... It's an epic film, you know, uh, and to me it is almost one film. You can look at films in like trilogies and things and 
you know, it starts and it ends, and, and that's it. You know, you can pick up, you know, Empire Strikes Back and watch it, and you know, it it works as a film. You can pick up and watch Godfather Part Two as a film. It works. I couldn't see myself watching The Human Condition two, or just three, you know, or even just one, you know. Um, it really is one flowing story, and there's definitely, you know, the, the three films neatly package the three segments of the story. But really, for me, it is one. It is one film. Uh, it doesn't matter which, which way you look at it, but either way, it is a monumental achievement in cinema. You know, it is incredible. Um, it blew me away. Um, I have to say that, you know, the, in this day and age, you know, you can't really sit down and watch nine and a half hours worth of film without being distracted by a Facebook message or a text or a phone call. Or, you know, you got to go do this or you got to go do that or your cat is, you know, annoying you or you just can't fully give it your attention. So to me, at times, I would not get as fully emotionally invested as I would have liked to, but it still moved me um, after the fact. When I, when I sat down and just thought about everything, you know, which is a shame because because it is a very striking film and an evocative film, and I definitely think that if I just sat there in a cinema and watched it from start to finish, it would just ruin me, you know, because it it deals with some very deep issues. I think the human condition. I mean, it's a very bold title again, like Joe said in his video. I'm going to steal that. It is a very bold title to just call your film the human condition. It is about being human, what it means to be human all set within the framework of this epic World War II story starring, you know, uh, a man called Kaji, uh, played by Tatsuya Nakadai. And the, film, the first film, No Greater Love, is three and a half hours long. It opens with uh, Kaji with his girlfriend Michiko and they're deciding whether to get married or not. He doesn't want to get married because he believes that, you know, what if he gets taken up to the military and called up and leaves her behind, but she insists she doesn't care, she just wants to call herself his wife. So they get married. And he goes off to uh, Mancuria. In fact, I'm not sure whether they start off in Japan or they're in Mancuria anyway. It's not really clear what he does at the beginning of the film, but he submits this paper about labor and working conditions and how for prisoners and workers, conditions can be made better in a way that will service everyone. It will make everything better for everyone, for the prisoners and the, the people who are controlling the prisoners. So his paper turns some heads and he gets taken off to this mining facility and there, you know, he... Um, he basically is the head of labor and so he goes over there and basically has to kind of tell the, the it's a mining facility and there are people who are kind of controlling the not controlling but oh, the supervisors of the miners can be quite brutal and physical to the workers there you know there's a couple of really nasty bastards who slap them around and stuff and beat them up to get them to work even harder and longer and you know Kaji stands up to this kind of bullshit you know and he really just he's a, he's a weak man you know, you can tell he's not a physical guy, he's a pacifist, a, a humanist, and but he stands up to the big bosses, you know, and says, this isn't right, this can't be done. And he's like, you know, you can't do this, we're going to put him, put him to trial if we don't sort it out. You know, I mean, he's really, it's a really inspiring film, the first film, when you really see Kaji come into his element, and then they bring in these Chinese prisoners of war to be workers, and they put them in this big enclosure, and this barren kind of landscape with a... Uh, barbed wire, electrified fences, that kind of thing. This is where it really resembles a war movie. And, uh, you know, Kaji, again, is trying to make things better for those guys, you know, um, and struggles along the way. You know, there's a lot of corruption going on in the, you know, the, the, the within the higher-ups and things like that. And so he's fighting against them, but he's also fighting against the, Ch the Chinese prisoners who don't trust him. They don't trust Japanese people. I think there's a... I can't remember what he said exactly, but there's a great line what Kaji says is that, you know, he... He doesn't feel bad that he's Japanese, but that's his main problem or something like that. You know, basically it's a, it's a condemnation of, of what Japanese people, certain Japanese people were like back then and how they, again, it's a bold film to make because this was only about 15, 20 years after the events that take place, you know, in the film. And it, they're really not painting a lot of Japanese people in a good light. So it was a very, a bold film with a bold title and, and bold content, you know, with a, uh, you know, criticizing their own nation in a way. All the Chinese prisoners of war played by Japanese actors um, and the, the Chinese language is subtitled on the, the left or the right of the screen in vertical Japanese text, but it's all English subtitles at the bottom. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a couple of good uh, people in the Chinese uh, prisoner of war camp, like actors, you know, there's a couple of good actors in there. One is a guy from Seven Samurai, in fact, and he was really good and he had a good little kind of, you know, quasi friendship with Kaji of course you know there's still friction there but I really enjoyed how it played out and 
the whole film to me was just fantastic. Um, there's some tense moments there, there's some not so tense moments, and for a three and a half hour long film, and I always think of Seven Samurai because it's a three, that's a three and a half hour film, it's not as exciting as Seven Samurai, it's, uh, you know, it's not as, not as good as Seven Samurai, but, you know, there's not even that much action in the film, in fact, I'd, I'd even say there's hardly any action in the film. But it is still riveting, it's still captivating, and I wasn't bored for a second of it, and it just flew by, and I was so invested in what was going to happen. How was it all going to turn out for Kaji? How was it going to all turn out for the Chinese prisoners of war in the camp? The one thing I didn't like about the film, um, and I guess I'll never really know the truth about it, because there's no real making of the film, there's not even that much information about it. People don't even really talk about this film, you know, this should be this big thing, but... You know, I only found out about it a few weeks ago, you know, and it's this absolute epic. Um, there's a scene where they're kind of showing the, the Chinese prisoners of war, you know, right, this is an electrified fence, and this is, what gonna ha this is what's going to happen if you try and escape. And they pick up a dog, and they just throw the dog into the fence, and it, it fizzles and stuff, and the, the dog kind of whimpers. Uh, it, it, it looked like it could have been a real dog to me, that they kind of, you know, maybe they, it was a special effect, the spark or whatever, but I didn't like that little cut of the dog being thrown into the, the wire uh, but then again it could have been a fake one I just I, I just don't know if it was so that kind of made me feel a bit uncomfortable and I'll also say that the violence in the film there's a lot of kind of just like slapping your backhands and stuff like that and a lot of times you can see that they're being pulled back you know and that uh, even sometimes not even connecting and it's just like ah come on you know you can take a slap to the face it's it's pretty you know it's not that bad you know it, it stings a little but uh, I just feel like you know, it kind of took away from it a little bit, but at the same time, I think the greatest film ever made is Seven Samurai. And there's a moment in that where T Toshiro Mifune's character, Kikuchio, stabs a guy, and, and the camera's at such an angle where you can see that he doesn't really stab the guy. He's just kind of putting the sword, you know, like, just by here. And he's like, ah, and the guy's like, ah, and he dies, and it's just, like, really badly done. But, you know, no film is perfect. It really isn't. So, uh, for me, no greater love is a 10 out of 10 film in its own right and it's not a perfect film by any means but it was a very powerful film and I love epic films you know I love films that are on a big grand scale and this one was even though it's only set around this camp you know it just uh, was a very long and drawn out you know you really get to see Kaji's mentality and uh, lots of characters are involved obviously being such a long film and so many you know there's so many people working there the bad not the bad guys I mean but the the higher ups you know who you know, they don't have to deal with all the shit that Kaji does. They don't have to deal with the prisoners and revolting against this and that and people trying to escape and people dying. And, uh, you know, it all comes down to Kaji at the end of the day because he's in charge of the labor and the working conditions. And while he tries to make everything better for everyone, the corruption within the system just makes it really hard for him. And again, the distrust from the Chinese who, who don't trust the Japanese and for good reason as well. So it's a very layered, uh, deep film with lots of, interesting beats to it um, and his wife Michiko who lives lives with him on the kind of the near the mining facility and the, the prisoner of war camp you know you get to see their relationship and how that develops when he is so embroiled and so engulfed in all this stuff that he's trying to make better for everyone and there's a, another great powerful scene towards the end of the film which comes into the climax and leads into what happens in the second film and there's some, there's some good characters there's a guy who was in the uh, the other Kobayashi film I've seen Harakiri um, he kind of falls in love with um, one of the prostitutes in the film. There's a, gang, a kind of group of prostitutes who are also characters in the film because they get brought in to sleep with all the prisoners, basically, because they feel like, well, if, if the prisoners get laid, then they'll be happy to work. So there's all that that side of it as well. So there's lots of characters in it and lots of things going on. And at times, yeah, I did kind of lose track. It's like, who is he again? That kind of thing. But for the most part, uh, followed it and loved it. And the film ends with... Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you like the way this sounds, then, and you don't want to be spoiled anything else but the second, the, the next two films, um, I'll put a link right here, not a link, but a bit of text that will tell you where to skip in this Japanathon video to where I stop talking about spoilers, okay? So just go to that right now. Because for me, I, I was spoiled a few things, unfortunately, reading reviews, and so maybe that kind of took away from my emotional impact at the end as well, how I wasn't as moved as I thought I would be. Uh, like I was with Tokyo Story, for instance, or Ballad of Nariyama so far in this video, and this, you know, Japanathon, because uh, I kind of got to spoil the major thing. I'm not going to spoil the ma most major thing in this film, but the end of the first film ends with Kaji being 
enlisted to the army. You know, they basically, and a big part of the film is that they say, right, you're going to go over and control the labor in this mining facility, in this prison of war camp, and you'll be exempt from military service. I also love how it, how it was a war film that didn't have really any action in it. It wasn't a big battle film. It was about the people there, the people who are affected by it, the people who have to deal with the, the side effects and the ramifications, repercussions of everything that's going on elsewhere in the world and also the fact that the main character, our perspective, is from a guy who is running the prison of war camp but he's not a bad guy. I thought that was really interesting and a really unique different take on a prison of war film basically. Uh, now the second film, part two, uh, or I guess part three and four, but uh, Human Condition 2, um, Road to Eternity, is a, it opens with Kaji being put into you know into military service and so we open up and he's in these bunks and you know he's, his hair's been trimmed back and he looks different you know and he's now uh, you know a private uh, or well I'm not sure what his rank was of actually I think he's pretty sure he's a, he was a private and he's there with all the you know the, the troops and stuff like that and uh, you know against his will because of something big that happened at the end of the first film you know he really ruffled feathers by by fighting for, for what was right basically so they send him off to the army even though they promised him that he'd be exempt so the film, second film opens up, he's there, he's in the army, and uh, you know the first the first part of that film is actually kind of a bit like Full Metal Jacket in a way, and in fact there's one scene which is almost exactly like Full Metal Jacket, there, there had to have been some inspiration there from Stanley Kubrick for uh, what went down in Full Metal Jacket, the particular scene, a very memorable scene in the first half of Full Metal Jacket is pretty much almost identical in, in uh, Road to Eternity. Uh, but you see Kaji again struggling with uh, corruption in the system and uh, bucking against authority. And while he was a weak man in the first film, he's starting to toughen up physically. You know, he's doing well as a soldier because he is completely driven to do the best that he can, the absolute best that he can. But he doesn't um, close his mouth. He doesn't uh, shut up when injustice is being is being done by the the treatment of the soldiers. And again, this is where, it, it, to me, Tatsuya Nakadai is just incredible as Kaji. He, he brings so many layers to it, and a lot of the times it's just his eyes. It's the eyes that tell you everything, and he is um, he was a master at doing that. Uh, in fact, he is still alive, um, funnily enough. But, um, you know, yeah, just an amazing actor, and he's brilliant in this. And then, towards the end of the film, you get this big battle. And for me, it's one of the best battle scenes I've ever seen. Is it flashy? No. Is it like huge scale? Um, no, it's big scale, but not huge scale. It's not not like you know something you see in Sacred Private Ryan or any of the films from the last you know twenty years or so. It's not huge and epic and sweeping cameras and explosions and all this. But there are explosions, but they're they're so chillingly real. You have these tanks coming in. You have these guys in the trenches, and you just see it from the perspective of Kaji in the trenches, and, and you just feel like. It feels real, you know, and again, you, it's this beautiful uh, widescreen, all the films are in widescreen, they're not uh, in 4x3, uh, so you get this great cinematography, by the way, from all, all three films look amazing, there's some fantastic shots um, that are just beautiful, framed, you know, perfectly, um, and it's in black and white, and it just, it makes you feel like you're there, and these tanks are coming in, they're firing off shells, and it's just something as simple as a mound of of dirt just being blown up, you know, a, a big mound of dirt, you know, like, poof. there's no big, like, you know, flash, bang, fire and flame, it's just, poof, you know, oh, it was really riveting stuff, and, and then the end of the film, uh, you know, this is kind of a, a little bit of a big spoiler, but I mean, well, I guess it's not really, but Kaji, you know, he's basically, well, most of his, his unit have been wiped out, and so he, there's him and two other guys left, and the only way they can they can sneak past is for Kaji to kill one of the enemy uh, soldiers, and so he does it. And this is something Kaji was always against. He was always a pacifist, and by necessity to survive, he's killed someone. And for what? Just to get to the road that they need to get on. And there's this look on his face, and he even says, "You know, I'm a monster. What have I done?" You know. And that's when it's the point of no return for Kaji, and you just see the character just go through so much in the second film and the first film. But by the end of the second film, it's just like, it is the point of no return, you know. And there's some great characters in the second film as well with the soldiers. And he actually refuses to be promoted, you know. He wants to stay at the rank he is. And so, so much great stuff going on in this one. I think this one was uh, two hours and 50 minutes long, something like that. Then we have the third film, uh, Human Condition 3, 
a soldier's prayer, and it really is a soldier's prayer because, you know, basically World War II ends, I think, in like the early stages of the second film, but you get to kind of, like for me, learn about what else happened, you know, there was like Soviets coming in to uh, Manchuria, basically, and so that battle at the end of, of the second film is between the, the Japanese and the, the Russians, basically. The third film, you have Kaji and these two stragglers, um, basically, uh, trying to get home. They decide, you know, well, Kaji decides, this is it, I, I can't do this anymore, I just want to get home, I want to get back to my wife. And you know, denounce the army. You know, I don't care. You know, if it's against the rules. You know, at this point, it's the war's over. You know, but still, people are fighting. Still, people are killing each other. And it's this trek through through the jungle, through fields. You know, they they encounter Chinese peasants who try and kill them. They encounter all these different kinds of people and refugees. And you know, they become part of the group. And Kaji becomes this leader. It's almost like The Walking Dead. And he's Rick, and he's leading these people across the country. And you know they're just they're just fighting for food and for water and you know he grows this beard and he just looks different from the second film again you know it's just such a great portrait of a character through you know three very different um, parts of his life but within this one through line and that was what was so brilliant about it to me was that and the, of course the, the big scale and everything but just such an amazing look at one character and the human condition, what it means to be human, the things that he has to lower himself to, things he would never have done in the first film, but it's just got to that point where war has changed him, and that is what happens to, to people, you know, it's a very powerful film, and lots more happens in the third film, you know, he actually ends up surrendering and being taken into a Russian Soviet uh, prisoner war camp, and it all comes full circle then, and he has to struggle with, you know, staying alive, basically, and along the way, he, he has this one younger soldier who kind of looks up to him and says, I'll follow you anywhere. And while they go through many iterations of the, the group traveling throughout the film, in the third film, people leave, people get killed, people die. And But there's the one younger soldier is always there with him and he goes with him into the prisoner of war camp. And, you know, uh, Kaji's trying to protect them, you know, and they've got hardly any food. They have to dig through the rubbish, the tip. And then the Soviets are like, they call in Kaji, they say, you know, you've been digging through the rubbish, you know, the, uh, through all the, you know, the, the thrown out food, you know, and that this is sabotage, you know, you, you're conspiring against us, and he's like, I'm just trying to get food, and again, the injustice of it, even till the very end of the film, Kaji is fighting against the injustice, he even tries to, to reason with the Soviets and to understand where they're coming from, you know, he even tries at that, that at the lowest ebb he's ever been at, he tries to you know, understand where the enemy is coming from and whether they should even be seen as an enemy. You know, because he's seen how Japanese people can be just like this. You know, who really is the bad guy? You know, there's, there's so many shades of grey in the film. And again, Kaji at this point has killed quite a few people in the third film and he's changed as a person, but he's still trying to hold on to the last vestiges of what made him human to begin with. Uh, and that is ultimately the most powerful thing of all maybe even more powerful than the very end of the film um, so yeah um, you've skipped this point in the video now and I feel bad because um, basically I'm going to drop a huge spoiler for the very end of the film so skip to this part I'm very sorry but I just I'm doing this on the fly so skip to this part and all spoilers will be over thank you the film ends Are you sure you want to hear this the film ends with Kaji escaping from the prison of war camp after a very uh, you know, intense scene, you know, some bad stuff goes down, he escapes and he walks home and it's winter and it's snowing and he has no food, no water and he talks to his wife, you know, he just talks out loud to her, you know, I I'm coming, I'm coming to you, I'll be there soon, you know, and then he just lies down and says, you know, I'm just going to rest my eyes for five minutes and I'm going to get back up and do what I've kept on doing, I'm going to keep on walking until I get to you, it's not long now and I'll be there. And he just dies in this barren wasteland with the snow almost completely covering his body. Such a such a down ending, such a depressing ending, but a realistic one. You know, there, there was no way he was going to walk back home, you know. And it's just, to see him go through so much and change as a person and do his very best but still end up, you know, fucked. That's life. That really is life. To quote the great Vince McMahon, life sucks and then you die. You know, it's what it is and so what Kobayashi has done here he has really 
Uh, and again, th okay, this is the point where the spoilers are over. So Kobayashi, what he has done with this epic trilogy is he has just really shown a lot of realism. You know, it's it's not a sugar-coated story. It's not a fairy tale ending. It's not a uh, you know, it's not tweaked, it's not romanticized, it's not idealistic. Um, Kaji is idealistic as a person, but the film itself isn't. And uh, many beautiful moments in the film, you know, there's great beauty amidst all the, excuse me, harrowing images. And I think that's probably all I'm going to say about it. For me, it's one of the best films ever made. I don't know whether I put it high on my favorites list, because it's not one that I think I'd watch that much. But definitely is one that I can't wait to watch again in the future. It's a seminal film, absolutely. Um, one of the greatest, you know, uh, magnum opuses, I think, ever as well. Just a huge, huge scale film, uh, but really intimate in terms of the characters. And lots of characters that appear in the first film, then turn up later in the third film. Or, you know, you get these moments where Kaji bumps into people that he's known before. So you kind of have to keep track of things. But overall, I wish I could have watched it all in one go. That would have been a huge, an amazing experience. But... To experience it over four days as well was was even was you know not even better but almost just as good I think because I was just like okay well, what's gonna happen tomorrow when I watch the next film you know and uh, the only reason I split the third film over two days was because I was falling asleep towards the end of part five uh, the first part of, part of film three and so I didn't want to be kind of just forcing my way through it and missing bits so I thought right I'm gonna go to bed get up and, and watch the the last two hours with a, a fresh a fresh mind and a fresh head so. There we go, The Human Condition. Absolutely staggering, absolutely amazing. I rate all three films 10 out of 10. Um, I wouldn't rate them like 10 out of 10 plus or like 10 out of 10, like the best films ever made, but definitely you can't rate it less than a 10. And as a whole as well, it is a 10 out of 10 film. Five stars, you know, A plus, amazing. Definitely check it out. Um, if you skip the spoilers, that is. Um, but even now, I think with everything I've spoiled, I think you can still watch and enjoy this. There's so much that goes on. I just, I felt like I, uh, again, I could talk about it for hours. But uh, again, uh, I think I should try and keep this as, as succinct as possible. And I think, okay, 25 minutes is not too bad. So it's down 20 minutes from the 45 minutes I talked about it when I first uh, finished watching it. So there we go. The human condition, done and dusted. Um, again, I don't know. I feel like I should just talk about it more, but I'm not going to. I think I've done enough. So, very glad I watched it. And, uh, again, amazing. So, the next one I'm going to watch um, today, um, again, I've taken a bit of a break now, but today I'm going to pick things back up with an Akira Kurosawa film. I have to do a Kurosawa film, and it's going to be one I haven't seen before, and keeping with the theme of this whole marathon, which is watch films I haven't seen before, except for Princess Mononoke. Um, but yeah, the, the one I'm going to watch is from 1948, I believe, and it is um, Kurosawa's Drunken Angel, which I'm really looking forward to because it is the first film that features um, Kurosawa mainstay, Toshiro Mifune, who is one of my all-time favorite actors, just ever an amazing actor. He's in you know Seven Samurai, Yojimbo Sanjiro, Hidden Fortress, um, Red Beard, uh, High and Low, um, Throne of Blood, you know, uh, Rashomon, you know, he's in all the great Kurosawa films. Well, most of the great Kurosawa films. And this is one I haven't seen, and it's the first one he did with Kurosawa. And also co-stars Takeshi Shimura, who's another one of my favorite actors, who's in a lot of Kurosawa films as well. So, it'd be very cool to see both these two guys on screen um, in an earlier part of their careers, or at least an earlier part of Toshiro Mifune's career. So, Drunken Angel, let's do it. Okay, so uh, I just finished Drunken Angel about 15 minutes ago, went and had a shave, had a think about it, tried to formulate my thoughts, and uh, I was really surprised by this film. Um, I'm a huge Kurosawa fan, but I just, um, it was one of those lesser talked about ones, and of course, uh, again, the first film that Toshiro Mifune stars in, uh, directed by Akira Kurosawa, the start of a great collaboration that have gone for 16 films, and what a great start. I mean, it was a brilliant film. Just the credits, you know, the, the opening credits, and again, it said Takeshi Shimura, Toshiro Mifune. I'm like, wow, that's the sign of excellence right there. Awesome. But it was over this, like, this little swamp that was, like, not bubbling, but, like, you could just see it, just the filth moving around as the credits rolled, and then it pans up, and it's this big kind of swamp area in the middle of this slum, and on the, the outskirts of this, um, or around the edge of this kind of swamp thing, uh, this kind of dirty pond was uh, this doctor's office and Takeshi Shimura plays uh, a doctor and this young guy comes in and he's a 
brash kind of young punk and he actually turns out to be kind of um, the, kind of a, 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 in the mob I guess you could say in the area is set in Tokyo uh, in present day so in the 40s and again a rough area of Tokyo uh, I'm assuming on the outskirts, of the outskirts of the city something like that and it's Toshiro Mifune and he plays this young guy who has kind of taken on the, the mantle of of running things around town kind of thing you know he's a bit of a bit of a gangster you know got a bit of a swagger to him and stuff got that air of coolness to him you know the slicked hair and stuff and he comes into the doctor's office and uh, you know oh I, 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 I forgot what he said now he hurt his hand on a jar or something and uh, Takeshi Shimura the doctor he's having none of it he knows that it's a, you know he pulls the bull out of his hand and he's like oh jar was it you know up to that effect you know so he knows that you know something bad's gone down and but he also warns Toshiro Mifune's character that you know that the the young punk, you know you should get yourself checked out for TB because it's going around a lot and you know someone like you young it could hit you and stuff and Mifune just oh, I guess he's really angry with him like what are you trying to say to me you know what what are you saying I've got and all this you just lying full of bullshit and uh, so Takeshi Shimura checks him out and he's like yep you got a hole in your chest you need to you need to you need to get that scene to basically get some max rays done. And he flips out and he doesn't want to accept it and stuff and he storms out. Um, and then we just see more of Takeshi Shimura as the doctor and basically their, their relationship develops. They keep crossing paths basically, usually because Shimura is seeking him out to try and make sure he gets the care that he needs. But at the same time he's not doing it in a kindly way, he's doing it, he's doing it in a kind of, you know... Oh, for God's sake, shut your mouth and, and, and get it sorted, you know, give him a slap, you know, just... Well, he doesn't do that, but just a real kind of, like, rough, tough love kind of thing. Um, and it is almost a bit of a stereotypical kind of thing. It's like, uh, you know, the, uh, the gruff, you know, old senior who kind of loves him really but doesn't show it kind of thing. But it's not really love, it's just this kind of, this need he has to help people um, and do his job, basically. But also, he's a drunk. And he says in the film, you know, I'm some kind of drunken angel, honestly. You know, I've got to come around to to punks like you and try and, you know, do the best I can. And to show him he doesn't want to admit that he's sick to himself because it would affect his street cred, you know, it would affect his position. And uh, so he's reckless and, oh, and it, of course he'd have to stop drinking and that's part of his, his persona as well. Um, now Takeshi Shimura, the doctor, is looking after this young girl. And, well, she works for him, I guess, I think is kind of what's revealed. And she's been there for a few years, ever since um, her old boyfriend or her, yeah, her old partner got put set to jail basically and he was not a very nice partner basically and she's kind of had a new start in life but she knows that this guy is coming out of jail any time now and his introduction into the film is a great one a scene with a guitar which was fantastic and uh, when he comes back on the scene he's the big boss and he's the boss of uh, Toshiro Mifune's character and the doorbell's rung and I'll get back to you in a second Right, so yeah, the, the big boss comes back basically and uh, starts making things difficult for Toshio Mifune who is getting iller and iller by the day basically and uh, I just love the relationship between him and the Doctor, this young gangster and the Doctor. It's a really, really cool relationship that isn't overdone, you know, it's not like hang out a lot, you know, they, they have interactions but for the most part you see both of their, excuse me, individual kind of day-to-day -day lives in this little area. And I just love the area, you know, the, the swamp. It seemed to reflect the characters themselves. There's a great scene where Mufune is just leaning against a pole, just looking at it and kind of reflecting on himself and just looking into this pile of, of shit, basically. And you really get a sense of, you know, what the character... It's a character who's hiding from... He's pretending to be this kind of guy and you can tell he hasn't had a, the best upbringing, you know. He says that, you know, who needs parents, you know. Obviously, he had a bad upbringing and things like that. Uh, and again, the doctor as well. You wonder about his background and why he's an alcoholic, even though he's a doctor and... Yeah, I, I really, really loved it. I was really surprised. I gave it maybe like a 9 out of 10. It was fantastic. There's a great... The ending is fantastic. There's this one shot towards the end where the camera pans around. It's just such a dynamic, interesting and dramatic to the story kind of like, oh, moment. And uh, it was just executed perfectly by the actor involved, the, the, the camera motion, the everything on set, the production design. It was just this one oh, brilliant shot. Uh, and again, just a really great little film. It's not a masterpiece, you know, there's not enough in it for that, but it is a really, really, really strong film. I enjoyed it so much. Um, and also there's another great dream sequence where the Shiro is trying to kind of confront the fact that, you know, he might die from this thing. 
and you know, he's going to have to fight it. And he might, he kind of dreams and sees himself inside this coffin on the uh, by the, the the waves of the sea, basically. And he opens the coffin, and basically his dead self chases him down the beach. It's a really cool scene. It's like in slow motion and like cross faded and stuff. And the print that I saw of the film was a bit rough, so that stuff was. It was a bit blown out, couldn't see it too well, so I hope that this film gets a Blu-ray release at some point and maybe give me cleaned up and stuff, because uh, the slow motion worked really well. But uh, yeah, overall, fantastic film, and uh, I'll talk to you about the next one uh, pretty soon. Okay, so this whole Japanathon, um, I, I planned on doing it over a few days, it's now been like well over a week and a half, something like that, and I'm trying to think how many films. There's Gion uh Princess Mononoke, Tokyo Story, uh, Youth of the Beast, uh, the Human Condition films, there was um, The Ballad of Nariyama, uh, Drunken Angel, of course, and I think this final film. Um, was it? I feel like there's another one, honestly. Um, yeah, I've dragged this out doing this and watching all these films longer than I should have because my memory is fading on them now, but um, the final film will be Sancho Deyu. And I've already watched it, um, and uh, yeah, I I was going to film me putting it on and stuff and kind of introducing it, but I just wanted to get this just video done basically. I've looked at the footage I've got already and there's too much. So, Sancho Deo, uh, which again, we started with this Blu-ray like a couple of weeks ago with the uh, extra film, Guillaume Biashi, but now it was time for the main event, Sancho Deo by Kenji Mizuguchi, which was supposed to be one of his uh, best films, along with Igetsu Monogatari, which I watched in my Unseen Classic Marathon last year. So it was great to watch this finally. It's also known as Sancho the Bailiff in the US. Um, I first heard about this film when Ryan Shatway made a video about it and said how awesome it was. So I was, again, there's high praise. I was looking forward to it. I'm not going to go too deep into the plot, but basically this is a film about a family that gets torn apart. Um, it's a period film that's set in kind of feudal era Japan. And you see this family from like a, a certain point and there's a brother and sister basically who are very young when the film opens and they kind of grow up as the film continues. And the kids basically get sold into slavery in this heartbreaking scene where they're separated from their mother and she's shipped off to this island where she's basically made to be a prostitute. And their father was this big high important governor, this uh, steward I think, uh, I'm not sure what the title is, but and he basically was championing uh, you know peasants and things like that and that got him in trouble and so he got exiled and things and the family got exiled and so they got completely ripped apart by this and as the years went on you know his kids were just trying to uphold what their father told them the last time they saw them when they were very young that just to be a good person and to help other people and the rest will sort itself out kind of thing and I'm kinda of, I'm brushing through it very quickly but that's kinda of the gist of it and you basically you get to see the two kids the brother and the sister uh, Zushio, the, the boy, and Andrew, the girl, and they get, again, sold into slavery, and just seeing their their, their journey, it is, really is a great film. Um, around the first half hour, I wasn't buying it as much, I think I was expecting more, especially the title, Sancho Deo, Sancho the Bailiff, Sancho the Steward of the, the place where the slaves are kind of kept. He is kind of, I guess, the villain of the film, but at the same time, he's not in it that much. I thought he'd be more of a central figure. Uh, I found his the character of his son to be more interesting. He was just kind of a just a just a villain, you know. There wasn't much to his character really. I might have to watch it again, but uh, yeah, uh, great film. The ending is absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the whole film's heartbreaking. It's a very down film. There are moments and glimmers of hope in there for sure, uh, which just again makes it a more fuller fuller experience. But overall, it was. Um, yeah, it was pr pretty special. Uh, I, I would give it, I give it a ten out of ten, but I'd say it only just brushed into a ten out of ten. Just the way it's shot, it's just fantastic. Great direction, great acting, a great story told. You know, there's flashbacks and things, and you get to see these characters grow up. And it's only two hours long. You know, it's not a big epic, but uh, it feels epic. You know, it's kind of a small epic. I think I don't know, um, but I absolutely loved it. Um, especially towards the end, when it all came full circle and I kind of had a, a fuller appreciation for the rest of the film. And I'm sure if I go and watch it back again now, because the first 10 or 15 minutes I was kind of struggling to figure out what was going on, like who was who, you know? Um, so I'm sure I'd enjoy it more the next time. But the only reason I say it's only just a 10 out of 10 is because, again, Sancho, the bailiff, he was just kind of a, just a mean bastard, basically, and there wasn't too much more to him. 
again, maybe I'd have to watch it again. But yeah, it is a great film. Definitely a, a you know, a ten out of ten. Only just for me. Um, and definitely one I can't wait to watch again in the future. Well, I say I can't wait. It is a very depressing film, so you have to be in the right mood for it. But Sanju Deu, um, brilliant. Caps off an amazing experience of doing this Japanathon. Uh, I'm not going to ramble on too much now because this has gone on for very long by this point. I'm sure if you're still watching, but. Apart from Princess Mononoke, nine new films I've never seen before. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, from people like Kurosawa, Miyazaki, uh, Mizuguchi, uh, Ozu, and uh, Kobayashi. Um, it's, yeah, it's been awesome. Uh, Imamura as well. I think my favorites were probably The Human Condition and The Ballad of Nariyama and Tokyo Story. Uh, and Sancho Deo. Oh, it's just, there's two. I, it's awesome to discover so many of these great films and to do it in this one video, as you're seeing it at least. Or for me, it's been over a couple of weeks. Uh, it's been really cool. And uh, yeah, awesome, awesome stuff. Some fantastic films. I highly recommend you check out all of them except for Guillaume Biashi and Youth of the Beast, which were pretty good, but not um, like you must see. The rest, though, definitely. Um, it's been an experience. I hope you've enjoyed joining me for it. And. Uh, yeah, um, there should be um, a silent movie marathon too uh, coming next at some point before the big 24 hour movie marathon for hopefully in May, at some point in May, maybe the end of May like it was released last year with the third 24 hour movie marathon. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed and uh, yeah, sayonara. Filming a skit for the Japanathon. What? <laughs> it was like you were stood there waiting for me to say my next line. You're yeah, like, yeah, what? yeah, yeah. All right, all right, fair enough. Okay, yeah, I forgot my bit. And then you're like, all right. <laughs>